All right, thank you, Mara. Well, many families are, are, are upset, we should say, with the local cemetery because they say their loved one's final resting places have become eyesores. Now, this is not the first time we've told you about the Ferndale Cemetery in Riverview, and we're often this time of year, there is flooding, overgrown grass, and even worse. Jason Colthorpe spoke to a woman who says her Mother's Day was ruined because of it. On Mother's Day, a lot of people came to Ferndale Cemetery here in Riverview to pay their respects, but when they looked around, they saw a lot of uncut grass and a lot of headstones starting to sink into the ground. The grass is about that tall. Jean Fitzgerald buried her mother-in-law in Ferndale Cemetery in 1979. She's used to the cemetery looking pretty shoddy in the spring. It's breaking my heart to think that they're in that kind of a condition that they, they paid for. You know, that's their home now. Other local four viewers pointed out dying trees and an old dump truck sitting out front that just make their loved one's final resting place look terrible. Sad, very, very sad. I say, I'm, I'm sorry, I agree with you 100%. Complaints come every spring at Ferndale and Lydia Odell has been responding the same way for the last 35 years. I said, it saddens my heart that you come out here and you're unhappy about the way things look. I said, my own mother's buried here, my husband's mother's buried here. We tend to the graves the same way that we do yours. Her husband's family has owned the cemetery for the 102 years it's existed. She says they don't make money and do the best they can. When we have the time available and the resources available and the good weather, we fix them. Come back on Memorial Day and see how it looks. Is that good enough for loved ones? No. Because of the fact it's been like that for years. Odell says she's actually gotten a positive reaction out of the initial negative response. She said a lot of volunteers have stepped forward to help with the roads and a lot of the landscaping. So this place, as she says, could look a lot different on Memorial Day. In Riverview, Jason Colthorpe, Local 4. We should also tell you that volunteer event is scheduled for May 22nd. And Jean Fitzgerald tells us she plans to be there to help. We have had a good bit of rain falling today and we're not done. No, we're not. Let's get over to Ben and find out when it's going to stop. Yeah, more to go and uh, we really don't need it, but it's there anyway. And it looks like Mother Nature kind of giving us a peace sign there with the uh, two bands of rain kind of converging. That one to the north uh, is starting to weaken a little bit and it's still making some progress north, but just you can see the northern edge of that not going anywhere. Uh, so that's becoming a smaller band, a little bit of a break in between from the city back through Westland, Plymouth, Canton, even up towards the uh, 696 96 corridor. And then the second band is the last of at least the organized showers that are around. But there's going to be some more around overnight. We'll talk about that coming up in just a minute. Remember, you can download the local forecasters app and track the rain 24 hours a day from your couch or your car. Severe weather alerts and a lot more right in the palm of your hand. Download it for free in your app store by searching WDIV. Devin. And uh, iconic acts like the Rolling Stones and Miles Davis have walked its halls, but now the federal government is looking to seize United Sound Systems, all part of a four-year-old drug case. Business editor Rod Maloney has been looking into this. He's live from Midtown with the latest. Rod. Well, Devin, you know, it was almost four years ago to the day that there was a, a traffic stop by drug enforcement officers at I-75 and 8 Mile. And in this complaint, it says a guy by the name of Mike Rogers was the guy who was picked up with a lot of cocaine in the trunk of his car, a lot of cash. Since then, they've charged almost a dozen people in the case, including one man, they say, actually used that money to buy this place right here. The United Sound Systems recording studio walls have rung with some of the nation's most iconic music. Barry Gordy spent 800 bucks his parents loaned him, this is the receipt, and purchased his first recording session with Marv Johnson, and that launched Motown Records. Before that, United became a rockabilly hub. The list of big names is long. Miles Davis, George Clinton, Aretha Franklin, Anita Baker, the Red Hot Chili Peppers, the Rolling Stones, the Doobie Brothers. That reminds us of Detroit's rich music heritage. But United Sound Systems, located at Antoinette and Second Avenue, now really rests at the intersection of Motown's storied musical past and its drug trafficking underground. 
To hear the feds tell it, it was drug money that took the studios out of foreclosure back during the downturn and kept it going. The man the feds claim put it there is Dwayne Lamar Richards. He's charged with taking part in a cocaine smuggling ring, and he's suspected of using those illicit profits to buy United Sound Systems and then used a cousin by the name of Daniel Scott as a front. The court paperwork seeks to seize the studios so it can liquidate the business as a secondary seizure in the case. The feds first sought to seize a 2006 Rolls-Royce Phantom, also allegedly owned by the ring. Now, we spent most of the day trying to contact the people involved in this case, get them to say something about it. And so far, nobody is talking, including the, the lawyers and even the prosecutor in the case. So we're just going to have to wait and see when they next get to court. Back to you. Well, in fact, when does it head back to court, Rod? Well, uh, it turns out that the uh, the gentleman in, involved here, the, the Dwayne Richards, uh, is due back in court in Ann Arbor on Thursday. And so we'll see then what it is. And some of the case uh, file uh, material says that there's the possibility that they're working on some plea agreements yeah. in all of this. Now, whether he has one or not, we don't know. But there is that discussion in the paperwork. So we'll have to see what transpires. Just two days hence. All right, Rod. Such a historical yeah. monument, too. Dozens of Detroit educators developed 12 proposals to help guide new academic initiatives in the Detroit School District. Now, the proposals include earlier literacy, expanding grades in schools, and a focus on math and science, also known as STEAM. Educators believe this will enhance communities and enrollment in schools. They estimate it will enroll or retain 638 students in the district, which is equivalent to $4.8 million to the DPS. The interim superintendent made clear that it still needs help from Lansing, but is focused on what it can do in Detroit to create a better district. We, Detroit Public Schools, must be in a position to communicate to current and potential families and to begin the process of enrolling students, at least capturing their interests. And today, of course, we're the district is creating a new page on the website to create transparency and track the progress of these proposals. Ferndale police say they're looking for a busy bike thief, a man caught stealing a bike from a school in Ferndale. Police say this man swiped the bike from Coolidge Intermediate School yesterday around 4 p.m. But police also believe he's the guy who stole another bike from uh, the Ferndale One Stop Convenience Store uh, last week. So if you've got any information about who this man is, you're urged to contact Ferndale police. A salt water seep from an old abandoned well in Southfield has been cleaned up. The brine seep was discovered last month when the DEQ was doing a site evaluation for an exploratory oil and gas well. It's now been filled with cement, which stopped the brine. An independent test was done to confirm there was nothing harmful, such as petroleum, found. So the salt contaminated soil was replaced with clean soil and new grass seed. All right, still ahead, why this is the week to wear turquoise and how it could help fight cancer. Just ahead. All right, and a big twist in the Mateen Cleaves sex assault investigation. What a police officer is saying that's putting his peers on the defensive. We'll be right back. Jeff. The controversial sex case against former Michigan State basketball star Mateen Cleaves took a surprising twist today. In fact, one of the cops involved is saying other cops broke the law working the case. Let's get to Rod Maloney. He joins us live in Detroit tonight with more. And Rod, this is pretty unusual. Yeah, this is really unusual, Carmen, to have a, an officer actually going against other officers claiming that he was pressured to find Mateen Cleaves guilty. And yet that's exactly what we have. And the pleadings have some interesting things to say. This is Monday Township Police Officer Brian Ogle. He's been with the department for 19 years. Right now he's working as the student resource officer at Carmen Ainsworth Middle School in Flint, there away from other Monday officers at his own request. He'd previously worked as an investigator. He also had attended law school and recently picked up his law degree and hung out his shingle as a lawyer. This is his business social media picture. In his whistleblower complaint, he says, quote, beginning in September of 2015, plaintiff found himself at odds with defendants because he would not acquiesce to defendants' pressure to portray Mr. Cleves as guilty of sexual assault, end quote. Cleves allegedly brought a woman he met at a golf outing last summer to this hotel, and she claims he sexually assaulted her there. 
Ogle claims, quote, on or about November 17, 2015, plaintiff, that's Officer Ogle, sent an email to Lisa Lindsay, a Wayne County prosecutor who was investigating allegations Mr. Cleves committed one or more crimes. Plaintiff reported suspected violations of Michigan state law, end quote, by his fellow officers. He is not getting specific about what those officers did to break the law. Ogle claims he was suspended two days without pay for making that complaint. He also says he suffered emotional and financial damages and wants more than $25,000 for his trouble. Now, I, I talked to Dan Atkinson, who is the police chief in Mundy Township, and he tells me that he is not worried about his case. There are five felony counts against Mateen Cleves, and he says it's a very strong case, and he does not believe for one minute that this case, that is a boon to the defense, uh, is going to have any impact whatsoever. Back to you. No, Rod, I know it's early in the Cleves case, but when is he due back in court? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's interesting. You